everyone, welcome to this special CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, your host of the CUBE. We're here in Palo Alto, California, and I'm here with a very special guest coming down from Seattle remotely into the CUBE studios is the leader at AWS, Amazon Web Service, the Vice President of Database Analytics and Machine Learning, Swami. Great to see you, CUBE alumni. Um, recently taking over the database business at AWS as a leader. Uh, congratulations and thanks for coming on theCUBE. Hey, uh, my pleasure to be here, uh, John. Very excited to talk to you. You know, we've had many conversations on theCUBE and also in person and also online around all the major mega trends. Uh, you've had your hand in all the action. Going back to your days uh, when you were in school learning and, and, and writing papers, and 10 years ago, Amazon Web Services launched AWS DynamoDB fast, flexible, NoSQL database that everyone loves today, which has inspired a generation of what I would call database distributed cloud scale, single digit millisecond performance at scale. And again, the key word scale. And again, this is 10 years ago. So it's, it, it seems like yesterday, but you guys are celebrating it. And, and your name was on the original paper with CTO Werner Vogels. Um, you're a celebrity, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Not sure about the celebrating part, but I'm very <laughs> excited at, uh, at least uh, played a uh, hand in uh, uh, building uh, such an amazing uh, technology that has uh, enabled so many amazing customers uh, along the way as well. So a little uh, trivia on on the the paper is you were an intern at AWS, obviously getting your PhD, uh, and then since since rising through the ranks and involved in a lot of products over the years, and then leading the machine learning and AI, which is now changing the game at the industry level. But I got to ask you, getting back to the story here, a lot of customers have built amazing things on top of DynamoDB, not to mention lots of other AWS and Amazon tech riding on it. Can you share some of the highlights that came out of the original paper? Um, and with some examples, because I think this is a, a point in time, 10 years ago, where yeah. you start to saw the kick up of cloud scale, not just just for developers and building startups. Yeah. Really starting uh, to see the scale rise. Yeah, I actually, uh, I mean, uh, as uh, you uh, probably know based on what you read, um, to explain the genesis of DynamoDB itself, I had to explain the genesis of how Amazon got into building the original Dynamo, right? Uh, and this was uh, during the time when Warner, uh, I joined Warner's team uh, as an intern and, um, and Amazon was one of the pioneers in uh, pushing the boundary of scale. Uh, and uh, year over year, our Q4 holiday season tends to be really, really big for all the right reasons. Uh, we all want our uh, holiday shopping done uh, during that time. And you want to be able to scale your website, orders, fulfillment centers, all of them at that time. And those are the times around 2005, and the answer is uh, when people think of database, they think of a single database server that actually runs on a box and has a certain characteristics in terms of scale and availability and whatnot, and it's usually relational. And uh, then uh, when we had uh, a major um, disruption during Q4, that's when, uh, yeah, ask ourselves the question saying, that why are we actually using a relational database for some of these things when they really didn't need the data model complexity of a relational database? And uh, normally I would say most companies uh, would actually ask uh, an intern or a few engineers who are early in the career saying, like, what the hell are you suggesting? Just go away. But uh, Amazon being um, enabling builders to build what they want, and uh, they actually let us uh, start reimagining what a database uh, for our scale could look like. And that led to Dynamo. And since we launched Dynamo and then we migrated uh, from uh, an, uh, a traditional relational database to this one for uh, some of the amazon.com uh, services. And then I moved on to actually start building some parts of our storage service and then our uh, managed relational database service. I explicitly remember in one of our customer advisory board, uh, which is uh, the set of some of our leading customers uh, who actually give us feedback on Roadmap and others, uh, Don McCaskill, who's the CEO and chief geek of Spunkmark and Flickr. Uh, and, uh, him uh, actually uh, looking at uh, literally me, I was standing in the corner and uh, saying like, you all built Dynamo and uh, why do I need to keep sharding my MySQL database and resharding as I'm scaling? 
And this is the time when the state of the art in most databases were around, like you start uh, sharding your uh, relational database and constantly resharding. And uh, this is when most websites were starting to experience the kind of scale which we consider normal now. During those times, it was mostly, most companies used to have a single relational database backend and start scaling that way. And uh, that conversation led uh, uh, internally and it resonated with a lot of AWS leaders and myself saying like, hey, what is uh, a cloud database reimagined without the hamperings of SQL look like? And that led us to start building DynamoDB which is a key value uh, database at the time. Now we support document uh, model too, but that delivered single digit millisecond latency at any scale. Imagine at that, um, so. Yeah, well, uh, I think about that time, at that time, 10 years ago, when you were having this conversation, and I know Smug Mug, and I've, he's, a, he's a totally geek, and he's, he's good to point that out. Um, you also had Netflix's customers too, I'd like to hear how that's evolved. But, but I think back at the time, if you look back then, I got to ask you, most people, we've talked about this before, no one database rules the world. That's now standard. People now don't see one database. Back then it was a one database kind of mindset back then. Yeah. And then you had yeah. a big data movement happening with Hadoop. You had the object store developing. So you're, in, you're, you're circling around that area. What was it like then? I mean, take, take us through that because there was obvious visibility that, hey, let's just store this. Now you see data lakes and that's all happening. But back then object store was kind of new. Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. Now, uh, one of the things uh, I realized uh, early on, uh, especially um, when I was uh, working with Bernard, even using Amazon.com itself uh, as an example, that the access patterns uh, for various um, applications in Amazon, but let alone AWS customers, tend to be very, very varied. Some of them really just needed an object store. Some of them needed a relational database. Some of them really wanted a key value store with a uh, fast latency. Some of them really needed a durable cache. And, uh, but it so happens uh, when you have a giant hammer, you use that for uh, everything looks like a nail, which was the, essentially the story at the time. And uh, so everyone kept using the same database uh, irrespective of what the problem is because nobody else, uh, I mean, thought about like, what else can we build that is better? So this led us to, uh, literally, I remember writing a paper with Werner internally that was uh, widely used in Amazon, explaining what are all the menu of workloads that exist? And uh, then how do we go about actually solving for each of these things so that they can actually grow and innovate faster? And, um, and this was uh, led to actually the genesis of not only building RDS and uh, Aurora and so forth, but also Dynamo and uh, various other non-relational data bases too, let alone also storage access patterns and whatnot. So, and this was one of the big um, revelations we had, uh, which is that uh, there is not a single database that is going to meet uh, the customer needs as the diversity of workloads in the internet is growing. And this was a key pivotal moment because with cloud, now applications can scale way more instantly than before. Now building an application for Super Bowl is way easier than before. That means the on, I mean, everybody is pushing the boundaries of what scale means and they are expecting more from their applications. That's when you need technologies like DynamoDB. And that's exactly what uh, DynamoDB set out to do. And uh, since then we have continued to innovate on behalf of our customers in the purpose-built database story as well. And uh, this concept has resonated well across the board, if you see uh, that the database industry has also embraced um, this methodology. It's natural that you obviously evolved into the machine learning side of it, because that's data is a big part of that. Um, and you see back then, you, you're bringing up kind of like flashes for me where it's like, those the data conversations back then and the data movement was just beginning. So the idea that you can have diversity in access methods of the kind of databases was a use case driven by the application, not so much database saying, this is how you have to work. The, the script was flipped. It, it's changed from infrastructure dictating to the applications what to do. Now the applications are going to the infrastructure saying, 
give me what I want. I want to access something here in an object store, something here in NoSQL. That became the genesis of infrastructure as code at a, at a global level. And so your paper kind of set the, 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 the wave, the influence for this NoSQL big data movement. Um, it's created tons of value. Maybe I heard Mongo might have been influenced by this. Other people have been influenced. Can you share some stories of how people adopted the concept of DynamoDB and how that's changed in the industry and how has that helped the industry evolve? In, uh, I mean, first of all, Dynamo is, um, we are fortunate to actually uh, share our experience of building and uh, a Dynamo style uh, data store where uh, it is a non-relational API and uh, showing what are some of the experiences uh, that we went through in building such a uh, paper. And we set out early on itself that it is, should not be just a design paper, but it should be something where we share our experiences. So even now, when I talk to my uh, friends and colleagues in uh, various other companies, one thing they always uh, tell me is they appreciated uh, the uh, openness with which we were sharing some of the examples in terms of learnings that we learned and optimizing for uh, percentile latencies and what are some of the scalability challenges, uh, how we solved and some of the techniques around things like sloppy quorum or various other stuff. Uh, we invented a lot of terms along the way too, but uh, people really appreciated uh, several of uh, some of our uh, findings and uh, us talking about it. And since then, uh, I've made so many other innovations that happened in the industry and uh, uh, within AWS, but also across the entire academy and industry uh, in this space. Uh, the databases uh, have been going through what I call as a period of renaissance, uh, where one of the things, uh, if you see our own org when Raju and I started on the database front is we started with the premise saying like, if you were to build a database where cloud is the new normal, this is again in 2008, uh, we asked ourselves that question and what would we build? That led us to start building things like DynamoDB, RDS, uh, Aurora, let alone we reimagined uh, data viruses with Redshift and uh, several and then uh, several other databases like TimeStream for time uh, series workloads or uh, Neptune for graph and whatnot. But at the moment we start actually asking that question and uh, working backwards from customers, uh, then you will start being able to innovate uh, um, accordingly. And this has worked really well. Uh, then more than 100,000 AWS customers have chosen DynamoDB for mobile, web, gaming, tech, IoT. And many of these are fast growing businesses such as Lyft, Airbnb, Redfin, as well as enterprises like Samsung, Toyota, Capital One, and so forth. So these are like really some meaningful uh, workloads, let alone amazon.com <laughs> runs on it too. So. We have an internal customer. It's always good to have that inside customer. You know, I really find this a really profound use case because you're just talking, you know, in Amazonian terms, I'll just translate for the audience, working backwards from the customer, which is the customer obsession you guys have. So here's what's going on, the way I see it. You got DynamoDB paper, you and Werner and the team, um, Paul Vassell was great as a great video on your blog post that goes into the to the talk he gave at, around that time, which is fun to watch if you look back. But you have a radical enabler here that's disrupting and changing S3, RDS, Aurora. These are game changing um, concepts inside the, the landscape of AWS. At the same time, you're working backwards from the customers. So the question I have for you as a leader and as a builder. How did you balance the working backwards from the customer while bringing something brand new and radical at that time to the market? Yeah. Uh, this is one of those, uh, uh, I mean, uh, hardest things we as leaders need to uh, balance on. Uh, if you see um, uh, many times um, when we actually work backwards from customers, uh, the literal way to translate it is uh, literally do what customers are asking for, which is true nine out of 10 times. But there is one out of 10 times, you got to read between the lines on what uh, they are asking because many times customers may not articulate that uh, they need to go uh, fast uh, if, um, uh, in the right way. They might say, hey, I wish my horse carriage uh, goes faster, but they're not going to tell you they need a car. 
but you need to know and be able to translate uh, and read between the lines. We call it under the bucket of innovate on behalf of customers. And that is exactly the kind of uh, um, uh, mantra we had when we were thinking about concepts like DynamoDB. Yeah, because essentially at that time, almost everybody would, uh, if, you, if I asked, they would just say, I wish uh, a relational database uh, could actually be able to scale uh, from not just like 100 gigabyte uh, to one terabyte, or it can take up to like 2 million transactions a second and so forth, and still be cheap. And uh, uh, But in reality, as relational databases, the way they were engineered uh, at that time, those are not going to meet those scale needs. So this is where we had to read between the lines on what were some of the key must have needs from customers and then work backwards and then innovate on behalf. Will these workloads be enabled by this and so forth, which are some of the reasons that led to us launching some of the initial sets on Dynamo, uh, on uh, single digit millisecond latency and seamless scale. At that time, databases didn't have the elasticity to go from like 10 requests a second to like 100,000 or uh, 1 million requests a second, and then scale right back in an hour. Yeah. So that is not possible. And we kind of enabled that. Uh, and that was an, uh, a pretty big game changer that showed the elasticity of the cloud to a database well. Yeah, I think also just to not to nerd out on this, but it, it enables a lot of other kind of cool scaled concepts like queuing, uh, storage. It's all kind of together, this database piece of that you guys are solving. Uh, and, and again, props to you guys and the team, congratulations. Um, I have to ask, you know, more generally, how has your thinking changed since the paper? Obviously you've got more experience under your belt. You don't yet have the gray hairs yet, but we'll see those soon come in. But you know, you're, you've got a lot more experience. You're running teams, you're launching a lot of products. How has your thinking changed in the industry since the paper? What's happening now? What's the big evolution? What are those new things now that are in the innovate on behalf of the customer? What's between the lines now? How do you see this happening? Uh, I mean, uh, since uh, launching Dynamo, we have uh, worked on, I had the opportunity to work on various problems uh, uh, in the big data space where uh, we worked on uh, some of our things uh, that you might be aware of in the analytics all the way from Redshift to QuickSight to, then I moved on to start some of our uh, efforts having built systems that uh, enable customer to store, process, and query data, and then analyze them. One of the realizations uh, I had, this was in around 2015 or 2016, I can't remember, was that machine learning was uh, hitting a critical point where now it is ready for uh, being uh, a scaled adoption, where cloud has basically enabled limitless compute and uh, limitless storage, which were the factors that were holding back uh, machine learning technology. Then uh, I realized that now we have a unique opportunity to bring machine learning um, uh, to everybody, not just uh, folks with PhD in machine learning. And that's when I kind of uh, uh, moved on from database and analytics areas to start machine learning, which is adjacent, um, area because uh, machine learning is powered by data and then started uh, building uh, capabilities like uh, SageMaker, which is our end to an ML platform to build train and deploy ML models uh, and is uh, what it does the leading enterprise ML platform uh, by uh, several Kaggle users and then also a bunch of our AI services. Uh, since then uh, I view uh, the reason I'm giving all this historical context is one of the biggest realization I had early on itself in 2016 is first, uh, machine learning is one of the most disruptive technologies we will encounter in our generation. This is uh, right after cloud. I think these two are the most amazing combination that is going to revolutionize how we build applications and uh, how we uh, actually reason about that. Now, the second thing is, uh, that at the end of the day, when you look at the end-to-end -end journey, it is not just about one database or one data warehouse or one data lake product or even one ML platform. It is about the end-to-end -end journey where a customer is uh, storing their order database and then they are actually building a data lake that has customer 
history and order history, and they want to be able to personalize and for uh, their viewer experience or actually forecast uh, what products to staff in their fulfillment center. For that, all these things need to work end to end. And that view is one of the big things uh, that uh, struck me for the past five years. And I've been on this journey in addition to building this ML building blocks to connect the dots so that customers can go on this modern end-to-end -end data strategy, as I call it. Uh, where it goes beyond a single database technology or data warehouse or an ML technology, but putting the, all of these end-to-end -end together so that customers don't end up spending six months uh, connecting the dots, which has been the state of the art uh, for the uh, past couple of years. And we are bringing it down to a matter of weeks and days now. Yeah, the speed's incredible. Swami, thank you so much for spending the time with us here on theCUBE. Okay. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks again, Sean. Thanks for having me.